Madness tight on the heads of the rebels. The bitterness erupts like a hot blast. Broke glass. A ritual of blood on the burning. Served by a cruel and fighting. Five nights of horror on the bleeding. Broke glass. Gold blades as sharp as the highs of a gate on the stabbing. It's war amongst the rebels. Madness, madness, war. Night number one was in Brixton. So Fran no B sound system was a beating out a rhythm with a fire. And coming down his reggae reggae wire. It was a sound shaking down your spinal column. A bad music tearing up your flesh. And the rebels them start a fighting. The youth them just turn high. It's war amongst the rebels. Madness, madness, war. Night number two down at Shepherds, right up Railton Road. It was a night named Friday when everyone was high on brew or drew. A pound or two worth of calling. Sound coming down, never king's music iron. The rhythm just bubbling and backfiring, raging and rising. When suddenly the music cut. Steel blade drinking blood in darkness. So, thank you for having me here um, and for your patience. I'm going to make sure I'm um, within time so that we can have a great concluding discussion. Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, hosting us here from Parasite. Um, so, I just played Lyndon um, Kwesi Johnson's Five Nights of Bleeding. His dub reggae poetry fearlessly described the truth on street corners and ghetto neighborhoods where young black people lived and had sound system parties in Britain of the 1970s and early 80s. Even Bart Marley thought he was too militant and didn't root himself enough in Rasta. Rather, he most believed in the revolutionary potential of poetry and struggle music mixing reggae grooves, testimonial narration, and dub that is in between languages, Jamaican patois in English. In Five Nights of Bleeding, LKJ calls out to the madness and knife fights, persistent rituals of blood and burning that become communal memory and shared scars. In truth, there is madness, and in madness, there is truth. Violence traversing from systemic oppression between promoters of rival sound systems and youth um, shielding from the lingering threat of police brutality that is an all-engulfing shadow surface. He said, Fanon wrote about violence in the anti-colonial struggle. I transferred that to what was happening around me, the violence at the hands of the police and among black youth. 30 years on, hasn't changed. Now they're killing each other with guns. Um, sorry, okay, there's something wrong with this slide. Um, there's supposed to be a lot more artist names here. Sorry, you have to just imagine that. Um, the riot is an extraordinary setting that has played a pivotal role in the permanent confrontation between dissent and power over centuries. The deeper crisis of capitalism, racial violence, and communal tensions has convulsed us, as Joshua Clover has written, into an age of riots. As master fictions of the sovereign nation state implode and hegemonic silencing of the oppressed only, only serves to reveal the cracks in governmentality, the project I'm presenting now, Riots, Slow Cancellation of the Future, brings together artistic works and research positions from different parts of the world, mainly located uh, between the 1960s and 80s. So up there is a work by Ala Yunus um, on the Egyptian bread riots. Um, and below is um, Jitesh Khalat's work, um, Anger at the Speed of Fright, um, that looks at um, Bombay and the kind of riot as a sort of a constant explosive um, surface of the city. So in endeavor to sense and chronicle the interrelationalities across these riots and uprisings to evoke um, phenomenology of the multitude. 
Social theorist Dilip Gankar, who I worked with closely on this project, has said, how might one account for the persistent rioting and rioting crowds of people within the evolving trajectory of capitalist time and terrain? In my judgment, our time and terrain is caught in an inextricable paradox, coveting crowds and fearing riots. It is from this double bind that I, um, with colleagues Gal Kirn and Nilo Fatajeri, with their background in philosophy and architecture, wish to continue studying the power dynamics and politics of disorder that surrounds and in turn comes to define the relentless collective energy unleashed through the riot. Before this, we need to actively recall the uneven operations of the law and go far back in computing the fury of the dispossessed, centuries even, as long as the colonial enterprise has existed. For how is it that repeatedly the white so-called lone wolf is never seen as part of a wider systemic terror as police shootings and gun violence continue to make moving targets out of the racialized subject long after Rodney King and still after Michael Brown. This film, which um, uh, some of you may know, the filmmaker John Comfra, uh, found a member of the Black Audio Film Collective, of course, um, made is, is very well known for um, Hans Wirth songs, Black Audio Film Collective, um, that has won awards and been shown the world over. Uh, but this particular film by John Comfra, um, it's a seminal film called Riot, which is from 1999, made for British television, which um, traced the riots in Liverpool um, that took place in July 1981 in a climate of economic recession under Thatcher's regime. A compra captures this turning point in Britain's struggle towards multicultural democracy through interviews revealing the ghettoization and racial abuse in Toxteth that escalated with stop and search policing tactics following the SAS laws. It chronicles also um, Thatcher's response to the riot um, and the continued oppression of black residents who come out um, as witnesses within the film. I'm, I'm thinking about this film also um, in terms of its long-drawn impact today, which becomes even more urgent to dissect. Um, it's a rupture that still bleeds, one might say, as post-Brexit UK begins to take shape. Um, Guy Debord, um, in a text called The Rise and Fall of the Spectacular Commodity Economy, um, published in the Situationist International, an analysis of the Watts Rebellion in LA during the summer of 1965, when, as, as many know, the city's black populations rose against law enforcement agencies, the police, and the National Guard. He notes, um, this is a passage, but I, I feel it's important to um, read to you about it. Um, so even those prepared to acknowledge apparent justifications for the black anger in Los Angeles, though not, of course, any real ones, all the theorists and spokesmen of the international left, or rather its nothingness, deplored the irresponsibility and disorder, the looting, especially the fact that liquor and weapons were the first targets of plunder, and above all, the estimated 2,000 fires started by the Watts patrol throwers to light up their battle and their celebration. Who has defended the rioters of Los Angeles in the terms they deserve. Well, we shall. Let us leave the economists to grieve over the $27 million lost and the town planners over one of their beautiful supermarkets gone up, gone up in smoke and McIntyre over his slain deputy sheriff. Let the sociologists weep over the absurdity and euphoria of this rebellion. The task of a revolutionary journal is not only to endorse the Los Angeles insurgents, but also to supply them with their reasons, to offer a theoretical account of the truth sought implicitly by their practical action. So there's two works, um, two artists here, uh, Glenn Ligon, who investigates the problems of language and representation when recounting histories of African-American identity. In his silkscreen print, 
untitled condition report for Black Rage, the cover of the book Black Rage from 1968 becomes his focal point in reading white anxieties around the black body and anger. By highlighting clinical markings, such as in a conserv conservation report, the smudges and repairs perform an incisive commentary on America's broken social fabric. Inevitably, what is the condition being marked here, and how are we to figure the conditions with which we are marked? Um, Sat Hoyt, um, the other artist, thinks through musicality um, as a spaces of both my mimesis and rupture. In these sculptures by Sat Hoyt, um, there is an appropriation and puncturing of the flows um, of certain emblems of corporal punishment. We see the whip, police batons, and the water hose. Hoyt positions the viewer in a way that is both conceptually grounded and atmospherically visceral in facing up to other counts of bare life against the oppressive tools exercising social control and total restraint in daily living. When I first saw this work at his studio, um, he said, uh, when I asked him about um, the diamonds that also look like bullet holes, he said, well, you know, the Swarovski diamonds, well, every riot has some bling. Um, the other device uh, in sculpture, Bula Matari, also, as, as, as some of you may know, stands in for the administration of the colonial agent, administrator Henry Morton Stanley, and the Belgian Congo, um, also literally um, as the breaker of rocks, but then became a terminology within a circuit of slavery and forced labor. These works also make me think about a passage in Tanahisi quotes between the world and me, which goes like this. There is nothing uniquely evil in these destroyers or even in this moment. The destroyers are merely men enforcing the whims of our country, correctly interpreting its heritage and legacy. It is hard to face this. But all our phrasing, race relations, racial chasm, racial justice, racial profiling, white privilege, even white supremacy, serves to obscure that racism is a visceral experience, that, is, that it dislodges brains, blocks airways, rips muscles, extracts organs, cracks teeth, breaks, cracks bones, breaks teeth. You must always remember that the sociology, the history, the economics, the graphs, the charts, the regressions all land with great violence upon the body. When state actors diagnose uh, subjects of civil society with affective categorizations such as anger and sustained rage, navigated through chronic suspicion, there is a disciplinary regime that is set into motion. The working of power through the sanctioning of normal versus deviant behavior and a biased scheme of punishment forced upon minority groups, including indigenous groups, over generations. In the face of this, there is a counter response, endemic fear, resentment, and alienation that at a certain point spills over into epic refusal. The rioter belongs to a common body believed to recur without a prescribed agenda, and often with no clear end in sight, unlike the protester. Yet, from what is often read as willful incoherence, incommunicability, there is an elemental registration against the neoliberal death trap. The idea of a homogeneous mass, however, is a myth we consume daily, and in no time, the crowd is transmuted by weaponized power into its negative, mob, looters, scum, feral agents. Let us also recall the multitude's emancipatory potential. 
In naming and unnaming the crowd as savage and as a vicious swarm, we are losing our freedom to currents of racist nationalism and fascism that are corroding political agency world over. The neoliberal state prefers to deal with atomized forms of social engagement, as we know well, rather than modes of aggregated energies and collectivity. In metropoles across the northern and southern hemisphere, there is an active breakdown of alliances and long-standing solidarities to produce new forms of alienation and the next part of my talk, the weaponized right-wing mob. How can we evolve possible narrations around riots and uprising through collaborative witnessing and as testimonial subjects in choosing to stir acoustic memories in filmic evidence initiating difficult conversations so that oral histories are not consumed entirely in those lost bodies and fires, and through reading images against the grain to unearth the traumatic core of contemporary mass violence. For the past decade, Chandragupta Thenavara, based in Colombo, has marked the changing significance of the 1983 Black July riots that preceded three decades of civil war in Sri Lanka with an annual exhibition, which is also a kind of personal memorial. The event cycle, however, widens. It is no longer restricted to that single event, but rather perhaps this kind of verticality of time. Um, because what he observes is modes in which the military apparatus continues to operate and flex its muscle through the drawings that you see um, here, the, the drawing here was made after the anti-Muslim riots in Aludgama in 2014. So long after 1983, um, how the riot is continuing to unfold. Um, and the installation work uh, VIP Convoy also looks at the kind of everyday um, a monstrous sort of apparatus of policing urban space. Um, this other image is by artist and writer Abdul Halik Aziz, who with this photograph and a news report revealed the aftermath of those Aladgama riots on the southern coast in 2014 and the destruction of Muslim homes. In this, what we see is also the making of a new enemy. Um, while the Tamil community uh, continues to witness uh, various kinds of ethnic violence and bias. There is also, with the rise of Islamophobia and hate speech, another formation of the enemy. Even while the exhibition was still on view in Berlin, in fact, a state of emergency was declared in Sri Lanka as communal violence and riots broke out near Kandy through the involvement of the ultra-nationalist Buddhist organization, BBS, against Muslim residents and small businesses. Um, within the exhibition, we also um, presented the um, decades of work, important work, that um, the organization Sehmat, Safdar Hashmi Memorial Trust, um, has done, uh, which is through artists, poets, musicians, activists, theater people, um, who are dedicated to um, conserving a secular fabric and artistic freedom. Um, and those are big terms, but that is why they've been working on this um, since 1989, um, supported by the current generation of cultural workers and activists. And um, Sabdar Hashmi, for those uh, who are not aware, was uh, in fact himself an actor, playwright, activist, poet, um, who was killed on the streets um, during a street play um, just outside Delhi. So what we see in these posters, publications, we see music concerts and exhibitions that were organized by this um, Delhi-based collective um, we see their aesthetic strategies um, that have struggled against the rise of communal forces, as I mentioned, over decades, really. Um, and, and moreover, um, they're also, uh, form, like, they've also worked very closely with historians. So to constantly um, retell history um, from, from a, a place of secularism and plurality. Um, so in, 
in this, we have one of the highlights I wanted to point out also since Inti um, mentioned this uh, when we were chatting before, um, is uh, in the middle you see the, the, the Ayodhya uh, timeline with various uh, annotated texts um, that that really uh, tries to form this kind of bigger picture about the demolition of the nearly 500-year-old monument, the Babri Masjid, in 1992, and the fraught archaeological status um, and religious status of Ayodhya as a point of origin um, stated by, by the Hindu right wing as the, the birthplace um, of, of Rama, um, and therefore uh, laying claim on it, um, saying, you know, the controversy which came first, the temple or the mosque, um, but through this um, justifying um, uh, demolition and uh, an act of rebuilding. The historian, and this is uh, also just a timeline of um, 10 years of Samad's activities. Um, the historian Romila Thapar um, assesses the comp composition of a political judgment around Ayodhya in 2010. The verdict, she, this is, I quote her, she says, the verdict has created a precedent in the court of law that lands, uh, sorry, a court of law that land can be claimed by declaring it to be the birthplace of a divine or semi-divine being worshipped by a group that defines itself as a community. There will now be many such Janmasthan's birthplace, um, wherever appropriate property can be found or a required dispute manufactured, so property and manufacture. Um, since the deliberate destruction of historical monuments, has not been condemned, what is to stop people from continuing to destroy others? The legislation of 1993 against changing the status of places of worship has been, as we have seen in recent years, quite ineffective. So the controversy continues, and um, this is why it's, it's so essential for us, I believe, for our gen my, my generation, to continue showing um, these sort of larger readings and create sort of alternative timelines, um, because Samet also reacted to the Bombay riots of 92, 93, um, often through going into public space, through exhibitions, through the act of commemoration. Um, this included also the Gujarat riots of 2002, um, which really affected me personally as well, since I'm, I'm from Ahmedabad and um, was a very young person trying to understand exactly what happened there. Um, and um, was uh, prevented by my own father to actually go into certain neighborhoods when I was a journalism student to actually um, collect certain testimonies. So that just shows um, how much restriction there is, how much fear um, there is years later. So um, it seems that, in a sense, uh, from this conference, it's, it's the question also is uh, perhaps um, not only what to let go, but how to let go. Um, because how, how to ensure that um, erasure mechanisms of the state and its judicial structures do not overwrite collective memory um, through violent justification of any majority group or, or sanctioning of uh, right-wing violence. Okay, I'm actually doing really well with time. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to talk about um, one, more, uh, one more case study and project, and then um, show you a short film clip, and that'll be it. So um, this is a work by Gauri Gill. It's a long-term project called 1984, um, which she started in 2014 which assembles a range of voices, including from um, friends um, and those who she met who are survivors. Uh, so it includes uh, writings by artists, poets, uh, filmmakers, and then these sort of, um, this, the kind of testimony that, that came through her um, visiting um, survivors of the anti-Sikh genocide um, that led to the murder and rape of over 8,000 Sikhs estimated um, in Delhi and several other cities in India during the course of three days in November of 1984. Following the assassination of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi and after months uh, and few months after what is called Operation Blue Star. So here, um, 
this was an important case study um, for, for me also because the boundary of terminology between the communal riot and genocide has been recodified by the community um, as, as a way to oppose um, the terminology used by the mainstream media and state narrative to implicate, um, um, to use the term genocide to implicate the state actors. Um, and Gil, so she, she created these photographs also when she was a photojournalist, so she was trying to see what forms of writing, what forms of truth production, what forms of um, possible justice um, can uh, be excavated and, and, and also produced for the future um, through this kind of gathering of, of evidence. Uh, in photography, in writing, and also um, a bibliography that she actually continues to update that has uh, any kind of article, important article, book um, on this particular episode. Um, in 1960, Elias Canetti wrote, one of the most striking traits of the inner life of a crowd is the feeling of being persecuted. So what happens when state forces instigate persecution from within the crowd? The government orchestration in inciting mob violence that lies behind this Sikh massacre is still covered up, with several perpetrators belonging to major political parties still roaming freely. Balbir Singh relates to this work by Gill in the terms of mourning as antagonism. So one might ask, how does the community deal with the state accountability while carrying a common traumatic wound? How can mourning be an act of antagonism and also a question of the loss of heritage, the loss of people? Um, what we decided to do um, in this in IFA Gallery Berlin, which is in Mitte, where you mostly find um, restaurants and designer shops, is to actually um, create, uh, just make large scale uh, the photographs of Gauri, um, including this sort of um, community produced kind of memorial museum um, for the victims of the Sikh genocide, and sort of plaster it on the first glass facade of the gallery. Um, so that this question of accountability is also being explored at the threshold between the inside and outside of the gallery in gentrified Mitte. Um, I'm going to talk about the last work and then show you the clip. The last work takes us um, back to the UK, um, and it was a commission. Uh, by Louis Henderson, it's called Evidence of Things Unseen But Heard, and it's um, a, an audio-visual collage uh, conducted as a sort of archaeological survey into the music scene of the city of Bristol, specifically plotting the Bristol sound. The pre predominantly Caribbean community of St. Paul's protested in April 1980 against the brutality of police forces in particular and against the racist institutions and conditions of economic oppression under Thatcher, once more. The centuries of colonial violence, however, echo back entangled with the nights of unrest resulting from a complex security apparatus activized by computerized police surveillance that was when it was starting up, um, at the stop and search laws, as I mentioned, but also the specter of slavery. In this sense, um, and, and, and some of this is, is Louis writing, um, rippling and reverberating through time are the sonic acts that unleashed rhythms of defiance against the police plantation state. The reggae sound system is imagined as an alternative public sphere with dub as its technological invention, creating, as Fred Moten has described, the sound that gives us back the visuality that ocular centrism has repressed. Riots expose the anti-disciplinary core of a society, its rebellious spirit, but also the traumatic fallout. Evidence lurks everywhere as traces inhabiting social relations and even becoming the permanent underground of a city, the permanent unspoken of a city. So we cannot fully grasp this condition. We cannot confront it. 
And therefore, I was thinking of drawing this reading to the slow cancellation of the future by Franco B. for Berardi and Mark Fisher, as we find ourselves wrestling with lost futures while investigating micropolitics of the crowd, but also the many languages of, of, of uprising that refuse the loophole of retreat. Okay, um, so this was the last of me speaking. And now, sorry. Okay. Dressing up your ignorance with respectability, beating down your culture and your history, scorning the words of upfulness, calling them illusions, fighting down your brothers and sisters, practicing discrimination, screwing up your face when you see us on the streets, calling us a disgrace to the human race. But don't try to lecture I and I with your false sense of directions. Well, let me tell you, selfish one, your children know where they are going. So when will you learn, oppressive ones, will you ever learn?
without favour or affection, malice or ill will, and that I will, to the best of my power, cause peace to be kept and preserved, and prevent all offences against the persons and properties of my Majesty's subjects, and that while I continue to hold the said office, I will, to the best of my skill and knowledge, discharge all the duties thereof, faithfully according to the law. Because we're black. Look, I don't care if you're black, white, or purple. You two answer the description of two coloured lads that have just seen stealing some property, and I want to know what you've got in that parcel. No rights, copper. You haven't even got a search warrant. Look, son, I don't need a warrant to stop and search anyone. Now, what have you got in there? Just showing the Fleming parcel. That's fine, lovely. You bought it, you've got a receipt. There's no need for all that hassle about stopping us and sus, and because we're black, all I want to do is check. Now, there's nothing in it. There's no sweat, no hard feelings, is there? Thank you.